Today we're going to be talking about radio waves and how we encode messages such as sound waves into electromagnetic waves. So one of the obvious uses for this is of course radio communication. The production and detection of electromagnetic waves has produced a revolution in communication. Electromagnetic waves travel faster than any other wave in the universe. This means that they're very useful for sending signals. A large portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, especially of the portion that's below visible light and infrared light, is today used for communication, that is, radio waves and some microwaves. Now, atmospheric observation means that we can't actually use the entire spectrum to send messages. We can't use, for example, X-rays or gamma rays, because these will be absorbed by the atmosphere. And we can't use the same wavelength as the radio waves that reach Earth from the sun, because these will become all garbled and scrambled when they become mixed with the sun's radio transmissions. So governments regulate the use of the spectrum. They say to people, you're allowed to use this part of the spectrum, you're allowed to use this part of the spectrum, and so on. So here we have an example of what some of the frequency bands are. We can talk about extremely low frequency, or ELF, radio waves, which have a wavelength of over 100 kilometers and are suitable for use for things that are underwater, like submarines. If we look at very low frequency waves, which have a potentially a much shorter wavelength, this is often used by the military. If we look at medium wave, that is medium frequency, that ranges from about 300 kilohertz to 3 megahertz, that's used for sound radio, in particular AM radio. High frequency, that is 3 to 30 megahertz, is used also in sound radio, as is VHF, very high frequency. Very high frequency is the wavelength along which FM radio is broadcast. Finally, ultra high frequency is used to transmit television. As you can imagine, there's quite a bit more information in the picture of television than just the sound of radio. That means that we require a little bit more bandwidth than we do for just sound. And this is why we use such an ultra high frequency. Between 0.3 and 3 gigahertz, there's a lot more bandwidth than, for example, between 30 and 3000. Here we have a bandwidth of about 2970 hertz. At the bottom, we're working in gigahertz. Remember that one gigahertz is one billion hertz. Now, radio waves were first discovered by Heinrich Hertz, and this fellow over here, in 1887. By 1903, just 16 years later, inventors were able to send messages across the ocean between America and the United Kingdom, proving how useful these radio waves could be. So since then, people have figured out ways to transmit sound using these radio waves. At first, people were only using Morse code, but eventually someone figured out a clever way to put sound, as in from a telephone or a microphone, through this radio wave so that it could be decoded on the other end. Now, radio signals use a carrier wave in order to transmit messages. As you can see, a carrier wave on its own looks pretty boring. It's a simple, predictable radio wave of a fixed frequency. That means that the broadcaster knows the exact frequency of the carrier wave to send out, and the receiver knows the exact frequency of the radio wave to receive. Radio receivers can be tuned to receive only a single wavelength, which is very, very useful. It means that instead of receiving all radio transmissions from all radio stations at once, we can tune into just one radio station, one with a particular frequency of carrier wave. If you look at the little numbers on the end of radio stations, like 102.5 or 630, it actually tells you the frequency of the carrier wave that you're listening to. So in the case of FM radio, 102.5 refers to 102.5 megahertz as the frequency of the wave. Whereas if we're looking at AM radio, the 630 or the 572 will refer to the frequency in kilohertz. So AM radio is broadcast on the kilohertz part of the spectrum, whereas FM radio is broadcast on the megahertz part of the spectrum. So what's the difference between them? Sound waves can be combined with the carrier wave for transmission, and this can happen in two different ways. That is AM and FM. We call them AM and FM because they're short for amplitude modulation and frequency modulation. We know about amplitude and frequency as properties of a wave. Amplitude is how large the wave is, how much it varies in the y direction, and frequency is how often the pulses of a wave come through, the number of pulses per second. And by causing these to change a little bit based on the sound wave that we're transmitting, we can actually encode the sound wave in the amplitude or the frequency of the radio wave that we're sending out. Let's start with AM radio. So in amplitude modulation, the sound wave is applied to the amplitude of the radio wave. We can see the bottom half of this diagram is a carrier wave, that's the boring old normal wave, that's been modified by this top wave. 
we can see that the amplitude of the carrier wave is varying like this, in exactly the same way that this top wave is shaped. The resultant wave will have the same frequency as the carrier, because if we look at the frequency of this bottom wave, we can see that the pulses are still coming very, very often, just as often as the carrier wave. So that means that the frequency of this wave doesn't change. So if we know the exact frequency of the carrier wave, then we'll be able to pick up this wave here. Then if we have a receiver, we can subtract the carrier wave because we know exactly what the carrier wave is going to look like. And so if we receive this, then the radio can tell us, oh, well, the wave that we encoded was this top one. And of course, that top one doesn't need to be just a plain old boring sine wave. It can be any wave you choose. It can be a sound wave, or if you're feeling adventurous, a water wave. Now, amplitude modulation is susceptible to interference. It's one of the disadvantages that it has compared to FM radio. Now, a lightning flash or a spark will in fact cause its own electromagnetic waves, including radio waves, and these will interfere with AM radio because the amplitude of the wave will increase at the point where the spark is. Now, when that radio wave reaches a receiver, the receiver will just assume that all the changes in amplitude were sent out with the signal that sent, with the uh, source that sent the signal, rather. So it assumes that any change in amplitude is part of the encoded sound. So if we have a change in amplitude that's not due to the encoded sound, it'll make the sound really weird when we decode it. We might get little bits of static or things like that when we receive the message. The other thing is that if the carrier wave is very faint, then the amplitude will not be very large. But once again, our receiver won't be able to tell that's because the distance comes, the wave comes from so far away. It'll just assume that it's faint because it was encoded faint. The sound will get much softer than if you had a strong signal. This means that if you have only a very weak AM radio wave, it will sound very quiet. So what's the alternative to amplitude modulation? It is, of course, frequency modulation. Now, in this case, the frequency of the wave does not stay the same. Instead, we're using the frequency to encode a sound wave, or in this case, a plain old boring sine wave. So the resultant wave has a frequency that varies and isn't quite constant. We can see that when this wave is at a trough, the frequency is quite low and the wave is quite spread out. And when we're at a crest, the wave is very close together. The wavelength is very low and it's high frequency. But we still know what the carrier wave looked like. The carrier wave is what this wave would look like if it didn't have sound encoded in it. Now the amplitude of the wave doesn't change, which means that no matter how the amplitude changes due to outside source of interference or distance from the radio station, we'll still retain that modulation in frequency. It does mean, however, that we have to have a radio that's sensitive to more than just one frequency. It has to spread out over a short range. So it, can tell, so it can still pick up the parts of the wave that are far away. Now, these waves are not quite as susceptible to interference. The reason for this is because if there's interference that changes the amplitude of the wave, it doesn't make a difference to us. We're not worried about the amplitude, only the frequency. The amplitude of the wave doesn't affect the message at all. So no matter how faint the message is, or no matter how many sources of radio interference are in the way, it won't affect our message unless they are of a similar frequency to our wave. In that case, we do in fact get a problem. We know that there are lots of different FM radio stations. Some of these have frequencies that are quite close together. The problem is that our radio receiver is sensitive to more than one frequency. So if we tune our radio to right in the middle of two radio stations, then we'll hear both at once. So there's a potential disadvantage of FM radio as compared to AM radio. It's easier to get two different radio stations playing at the same time. This is because the frequencies overlap as they vary. It turns out we can also send digital information using radio waves. And to do this, we need to encode it in some sort of carrier wave. So we'll change the information, that is ones and zeros, digital signals, into an analog wave, send it through the phone system, have it received at the other end, and then convert it back into digital information. So we take it from digital, turn it into a wave, turn it back into digital, and receive it. The device that does this is called a modulator demodulator except because that's a bit of a mouthful, people shorten it to modem. And of course, modems are used everywhere for internet. So that's the end of the theory. We'll learn a bit about encoding sound waves into electromagnetic waves in different ways. Let's go on to some questions. What are the two different ways of encoding a sound wave in a carrier wave? Is it modulation and demodulation, amplitude and frequency modulation, velocity and intensity modulation, or wavelength and period modulation?
The answer here is, of course, the reason that we have AM radio and FM radio. The answer is B. We have amplitude modulation, AM, and frequency modulation, FM. Question 7. Which of the following is not a use of radio waves? Is it broadcasting music, broadcasting news reports, broadcasting television, or broadcasting electricity? All you have to do here is think about which of these you can find on a radio. Broadcasting music and news reports, of course, happens all the time. Broadcasting television is actually a use of very high frequency radio waves. The radio waves, instead of just carrying sound information, carry sound and picture information. What radios can't do, though, is generate their own electricity from the radio waves. The D, in fact, is going to be the correct answer. Radio waves are not used to broadcast electricity, they're used to broadcast music and news reports. In fact, because electromagnetic waves do carry energy, it is possible to transmit electricity, although that's what, not what they're used for today. Question 8. Is this wave a result of FM or AM encoding? So to find out, we need to figure out what changes. Does the frequency change? No. The carrier wave, that is the wave with a very, very small wavelength, is always the same distance apart. Does the amplitude change? Yes. There's a big variation in amplitude all over. So it is amplitude modulation. The frequency does not change, the amplitude does. That means that the sound wave, or in this case the sine wave encoded, changes the amplitude. So sketch the decoded wave. We know that when the amplitude is very small, the wave will be at a trough. When the amplitude is very large, the wave will be at a crest. So a wave should look something like this. We'll just trace out the amplitude of the wave. If you want it a bit neater, it might look something like this. We can see that it's always going to line up with the original wave, which is a small piece of germanium. These days we use semiconductors and transistors to do the same job. Question 9. Is this wave a result of FM or AM encoding? Now what changes? Does the amplitude change? No, it stays the same. Does the frequency change? If you look carefully, then you can see that yes, it does. There are points here, here, and here where the frequency is much lower than the rest of the wave. So it's frequency modulation. The amplitude doesn't change. So sketch the decoded wave. We know that points with very low frequency, like these points here, will correspond to troughs in the decoded wave, and that in between these, there must be crests. We can see that directly in between the arrows I've drawn, the radio wave has a much higher frequency. So our wave will look something like this. Once again, we can see that the troughs match up with the arrows and the crests match up with the spots between them. Question 10. Why do governments restrict the use of the electromagnetic spectrum? Couldn't we have everyone, you know, broadcasting their own radio station? Well, the answer to that is, of course, no, because there's not enough spectrum. Not all frequencies of electromagnetic wave can be used to communicate. There are some that are so high energy that they're dangerous, and some that are absorbed by the atmosphere, and some that uh, you get from the sun, which would cancel out any attempts at communication on Earth. The other thing is that we can only send one transmission at a time over a given frequency. Otherwise, we would receive two messages at once, and it's like a recording of two sounds at once. It's very hard to tell them apart. We have only a limited amount of bandwidth. We don't have an infinite amount that we can actually use for transmissions. So that's the end of the questions, which means we're now at the, the end of the lesson. So in this section, we've learned about how we encode sound waves in electromagnetic waves using amplitude modulation or frequency modulation.